Hey, everybody. On today's show is Terry Short. Terry is a human potential developer. She's partnered with Lisa Solis DeLong, who's the chief spiritual officer at her company, and Deanna Carpenter, who's the sound conduit, to transform the world one leader at a time. She's the founder of Short Group LLC, which is an umbrella company for thriving leaders everywhere. She's been in key management roles at the Four Season Hotels, guest ranches that she's opened in Montana, and has consulted for some of the most elite resorts in the United States. She's published uh, she's a published author. You're a published author, Terry Short, most recently in 2020 of the book, The Words We Choose, Your Guide to How and Why Words Matter. Terry Short, words matter. Yes? Indeed. Every day. When every did, word. First of all, thank you so much for having this conversation. And oh, it's my honor. I think that just starting where words matter is such an interesting, it's something I really believe personally. I really think our words create our world. But in yes. leadership and in corporate, I'm curious, why are you finding that talking about words mattering, why, why is that important right now in, in leadership and in corporate? Oh my gosh, Jake, it drives everything. You know, So I've known this for a while from a business perspective, but what I came to understand recently is that how much it drives our inner narrative and that inner narrative drives our sense of self. And that drives our ability to lead ourselves well and then to lead others well. So I've taken all that and distilled it down into the, the identifying the words that limit and minimize and then replacing them with the words that elevate and inspire oneself and others. So there's, you know, there's just some, some words to pay attention to that make a huge difference. And, you know, I love it when I, when I'm coaching and people go, well, wait a minute. I use that word all the time. And yes, that's right. When I change up just that one word, it'll make a huge difference. Mm. And you talk about often how, it, or, or, or you've talked about in, in, the, in the mind that the inner narrative. So yes. is your coaching, is it a corporate, are, are you doing mm -hmm. like how you were trained in like for, for coaching and leadership or are you focused more on the mind or both or like what's the balance in your work? Yeah, great question. It's both because we have to start there. So I see, I see you with your headset on and I think about how it's our personal podcast that we have to start with, right? When I, everybody has their headsets on and we're walking around, we're listening to the podcast. Reality is we're listening to our personal podcast 24 seven, right? And so the, the job one- And we can never is, shut it off. We can never shut it off. No, no. Sometimes like you know, three o'clock in the morning, there it goes. And, and, but here's the deal. When we learn that we're the producer uh, we're the director, the narrator, the host. We get to decide who comes on. You know, it takes some people a long, took me a long time, took me a long time to understand that I played all those roles and that it was my job and my choice to decide what that narrative was going to be like and who mm. was going to be on, mm. right? I really love that you've brought it back to our own personal choice and our own decision and autonomy because mm -hmm. I think that so many people are like, delving into mindfulness and meditation who are also in leadership and they're trying to quiet this this voice and I, I kind of love that you're saying maybe just be aware of it don't necessarily quiet it down or you don't have to focus on quieting it down it's nice just to bring awareness to it so that way it's like you become an observer of what's happening rather than controlled by what's happening that's right. That's right. And I, um, since we met last, Jake, I've been geeking out on the neuroscience behind that quite a bit, right? And so what happens is that personal podcast we have through conditioning and, you know, experiences and, you know, life, we have our go to way. So when a, a, the narrative comes in, some people think about it as the, the rings or the etching on a, on an album. I think about it as the yellow brick road. You know, it, some thought comes in and my, my, how I react to that thought is, is very well established. So it's the yellow brick road. My neural pathway is this given way that I'm going to go. What I coach is that interception there. So that's the mindful moment. That's breath work. There are lots of different practices, right? That are that, that great. Okay, now we're going to stop right there before we go down the yellow brick road, and we're going to now create another neural pathway. Oh, that's great. And that starts with the inner narrative. This is really great. Yeah, I think that also when you go down the yellow brick road, as you're talking about, it's like, you know, most of our reactions to things as leaders, 95% are fine. It's the 5% that is the blind spot 
that we don't that we can't see or we don't know what we don't know that's what kind of screws you up as you're as you're trying to be effective in decision making or dealing with a particular crisis or whatever as a leader and it's like i bet that's very helpful to have that neuro how did you call it neuroscience background no. neuroscience well i so i've done a yeah, well, you're creating a neural new neural pathway. So I did a, a neural mindfulness certification that was it's it was life changing for me and how I coach. Mm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, being able to interrupt that as like a pattern interrupt and restructure right. it. That's cool. Great. That's right. One of the things that you say is that we can no longer lead ourselves and those we serve without being master weavers of well being. How do leaders begin to? Um, explore what well-being looks like for them. How do we begin to, yeah. if we've been unable or unwilling so far, Terry Short, how do we mm -hmm. actually start to explore this core of our being, which is well-being and, and feeling aligned? Absolutely. That, so that's what it's about, is that the, it has to start with the individual. And that's, that's the first thing, Jake, is so many people don't realize that. They say, particularly in healthcare. So I also had 10 years in healthcare, and they say, oh, okay, well, I, I care about the well-being of my people. And yet, they're spinning at a million miles an hour. And so they're not, they're not owning it. They're not representing what well-being looks like. So, I, so that's first. That I'm glad you hit on that, that it's about the individual. So we start with identifying what is well-being. What would bring you more joy? What 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 do you want to feel like? What do you want to be different in your life? And you know, everybody's able to identify their well, I shouldn't say everybody. It takes a while sometimes for people to identify their pain points and what's really holding them up. But a lot of times I, I don't go through a week without coaching somebody that says, I can't juggle my competing demands. Okay, let's just use that one thing. I can't juggle my competing demands. What if? You paid attention to your own well-being first, and you prioritized that, and it, and got yourself oh, to wow. a place that you you could center at will, right? You could center at will, and you approached then those competing demands differently. Oh, I like this because so much of like the reptilian brain wants to focus on what's not working. That's right. And that if That's you can right. actually say, "Whoa, whoa, I get your competing demand." Competing demands is that what you said? I get that you have your competing demands, but let's talk about your well-being. Do you find that clients get frustrated when you flip the script on them like that? Sometimes, yeah, but they, it depends actually how ready they are. If they're pushing up against those competing demands so fast and furious, they need to feel that, find that crack. They need to find, the, you know, it breaks my heart, Jake, to hear people that are, you know, younger than me saying, oh, you know, not, not enough time with the kids. And when they're talking about competing demands, not enough this, not enough that. And I think, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is your opportunity to change that. Don't wait. Don't wait until you're older. Like, let's find that crack in the space now to to fill in with the well-being and prioritize that as important. Like, that's the that's the place to start. People aren't even making the well-being a competing demand. Oh, right. Wow. They're not saying <laughs> so. It should. That's the first thing I want people to say. My well-being, my wow. spiritual well-being, should be one of my competing demands. It starts there. Wow, Terry, I know that you teach this all the time, so it's like very normal for you, but like I just had a bit of an aha. Uh -huh. Like well-being, <laughs> spiritual fitness, physical fitness, these things are all things that you do outside of or that we think of outside of our competing demands. This is very powerful to me. Right. Actually, Jake, I, I went so far as to create a calendar at the beginning of a couple of years ago. And it and it so I want to envision a world where everyone, maybe even Outlook would partner with me and they dish the calendar shell has <laughs> the spaces for prioritizing your well-being before you ever put a meeting in. Uh -huh. Right. The the shell of it should be all about you. Wow. That's how we should be living our lives. Wow. This is so good. This is so good, Terry Short. So, you know, I listed some of the corporations and hospitality businesses that you've consulted with or worked with full time over the years. Was there a moment in your life when your well-being was just, was just like shit and you weren't focused on it and you had to like reel <gasps> it in? I know. I'm sorry. Oh, I know. You, I know you're corporate and professional, but I'm going to be authentic, Terry. Has your no, has yeah, your well being yeah. ever gone down the drain? And what did you do about it, Terry Short? Okay. Well, here's the deal. I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't be planning a, a retreat at Imaloa yeah. had that not happened. Okay. So had tell I me the story of when it, that. when did it happen? Right. Well, I was on the road, Jake. Uh, let's see. I was on the road three out of four weeks in a month, 
right? My kids navigated through junior high and high school and all of their sporting events and everything while I was just, you know, you know, in airports. And, uh, and then I said, they, right, they were pushing up against senior year when it occurred to me when we had these, uh, the last basketball game and the last this and the last, and you know, it's springtime. People are experiencing that right now. And I went, wait a minute. I don't recall the first or the second or, you know, and here we are at the last. Wow. How did that happen? Right. And the next thing you know, they were graduating and I went, you know, shoo, shoo, shoo. <laughs> no, this has got to change. And that's when, and it, it was, so it was a reflection on myself as a mother, basically, to be very vulnerable. Um, that really got me to understand that it wasn't just how I was being as a mother. It was how I was being as a human and how, how I was not indeed prioritizing my own well-being, which is then a reflection on how I wasn't prioritizing the well-being of those around me. Wow. And by the way, they were seniors in high school or the senior in high school at the time when you yeah. realized this and proves that it's never too late. Like you got this it and you took action. Yeah. And you know what I'm really proud of, Jake, is that so they're in their 20s now. They're in their mid 20s. And they've heard me say many times. So they, the where do I go from there is that now I'm going to impart this knowledge to them so they don't make the same mistakes. And they've heard me say many, many times. I, I'm on a mission for people to be sage at any age, right? They don't have to wait to be as old as I was when it when that happened. We can learn these things. We can have these practices. We can look at, we can uh, develop a different perspective to be sage at any age. Cool. Don't wait. Cool. One of the things yeah. that you say also is that leaders imagine a safe place that you'd, you'd like for leaders to be able to imagine a safe place to explore inner wisdom and bring that more into their workplace and that they mm -hmm. often, people that you work with, dream of reconnecting with self potential and purpose. I'm curious, what needs to be true in the lives of leaders, perhaps who you coach or who are listening to this, perhaps they're looking for a retreat like yours, what needs to be true for them that will allow them to explore their dream and their inner wisdom? What has to be fundamentally true? Mm -hmm. They have to realize the disconnect first. Right. So I can't offer somebody the pathway to, to reconnecting to them, their, their inner knowledge, their, their inner wisdom, their self, and therefore to others until they realize it's broken first. So if someone's right? listening, so how do they know that it's broken? I mean, if it's, if you're it. unaware that it's broken, how do you find out that it's broken? Especially if you make a lot of money and you don't need to look at these things. <laughs> Excellent question. I love it. You're a very good interviewer. Thank you, Terry Short. <laughs> It's an excellent question. So how I would do that is I, I constantly assess what's aligned with my values. So in a given day or at the end of this call, I'm going to say, huh, what value did I bring? And was, was what I put out in the universe in this conversation with Jake aligned with my values? At the end of the day, I'm going to say, is, is what I did and what I contributed today aligned with my values? And when I interact with my kids, is it aligned with my values? I trained myself, Jake, to leave a hospital where I was coaching. And when I opened the door to the front door to the hospital and I walked through between there and the car door, I would say, what value did I bring? What, what about my contribution was important today? And I'd answer that question first and foremost. So when you start asking, anybody listening, when you start asking about the value of your contribution and feeling into whether that uplifts you, or you go, wait, what? No, there's a disconnect. <laughs> That's when you know okay. that it's, it's not happening for you. <clears throat> so that, it occurs to me that that is really for someone who is even a little bit self-aware. If you can take me back to when you realized that you were going to the last game and you don't remember the first or the second or the recital or whatever it is you were going to, did someone say something to you that woke you up and you it caused you to reflect? Did you have a, a, a interaction with your kid? Like, what was that moment of like, yeah. whoa? Okay, so I can remember it very clearly. They had a parent. Okay, now you might make me cry, Jake. <laughs> they had a um, like the the very last parent child night. And so my husband and I it was basketball for my daughter and it in track for my son. And it's the same routine for every sport. And you bring flowers and then they call the your kid's name and you go down on the basketball court, let's say. And I got down there and I started getting all teary eyed. And I thought to myself, okay, wait a minute. I'm experienced this last with her. And I started crying and I thought, oh, and I couldn't stop. And I thought I'm crying because I now realize 
I didn't experience so many of the ones in between first and last. And it just made me super sad. And so it was the breaking point of understanding the value of the work I was doing and the disconnect between my own personal values. So there's two plays on the word value there, right? I was talking about a few minutes ago about the value that I bring with my contribution. Does that align with my own personal values? And at that point, I knew for sure it didn't. Mm. Didn't align with the value of being a present mother or being present, period. (laughs) One one of the things that I really believe, Terry, is that the more personal something is, the more universal it is. And I'm so grateful that you shared that because even if people are listening who maybe are, are leaders struggling with this, that won't necessarily come on your retreat, or maybe they're curious about it. I think that when they hear someone else who's as successful as you are really articulate that moment, their sensitivity to the potential of that moment happening in their lives is, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, they're open to it. And that's why I asked you the, the, how personal it was. And I really appreciate that very much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you know, to be honest with you, it happened at work too. You know, I've had, so I think once you crack open like that, you start to see it differently. You start to see that vulnerability differently. And I would, I was more aware of how I felt I was letting down others that I was in, was in a position to help grow and nurture. Mm -hmm. And my speediness forward and, you know, all that I was allegedly juggling you know, um, was preventing me from bringing out the best in others. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. So that was you as a leader. Let's flip the script a little bit. And you have clients now like Google, Salesforce, Chevron, Fidelity, Marriott. Where are companies most getting it wrong in terms of their people? Where do you put a stake in the ground when you get started with them? Like, where is your stake? These massive companies, here you are on the inside as a consultant, you've been on the inside as a team member before, where are they most getting it wrong with their people? And where do you start working with them in that regard? Yeah, so I'm big on diagnosis. So it so it could be different for different companies, right? It's not one size fits all. So that's a that's a process to diagnose where they're getting it wrong. And it, oftentimes, I guess if I'm speaking generally, they're giving lip service to well-being and they're saying, oh, yes, we're, you know, you can work remotely and you can do this. And this is, this is what our people want, but they don't really know. And then once they create this, this initiative or what have you, and they lay this out there, they're not following up to the degree that they understand the value to the individuals. So, when I say normalizing well-being, what I mean by that is that leaders are trained to ask the right questions. They're trained to share what they're doing, and particularly to, to cultivate their own well-being. They're, at, they're, they're in their pocket. They are armed with the right probing questions to truly understand where each of the people that report to them stands and if they are in a good place. Like even, so we're talking about general well-being and spiritual well-being. Now, this all leads to mental health as well, which we know is a is a huge chronic issue in our country, at least, if not the world. And so this is, these conversations are the precursor to having your finger on the on the pulse of that. Interesting. So you think that the power of the questions actually determines whether or not a company can be an advocate, an effective advocate for well being for, for their people? Well, the power of the questions and then the true active listening, the leading in and hearing, because, you know, I I hear a lot of, we had a town hall and we asked these questions and, and we, you know, we, we did, we, we asked probing questions and we brought this topic up, but then there's A, not the right active listening and B, that listening doesn't, that doesn't lead to the right follow-up actions. Hmm. And so then it all crumbles again. So there's, so a lot of companies out there, Jake, have great intentions. Some of those companies that you listed are leading the charge, absolutely leading the charge on prioritizing well-being in the workplace. Mm. And yet the, the, the consistency of it is what's at, um, what's at risk. It's so interesting to me because your work really, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is just what I'm hearing. Your work really goes back and forth between the team member, the team member and uh and the corporation and the and the and the companies and so that that's very unique because a lot of coaches 
coach from an outsider's perspective, but you also, it seems like you care both about like the C-suite teams and also people who are just leaders within their companies as well. Like you're, 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 you're playing both. Is that like you work with both? Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. See, Jake, I learned a long time ago, this is this, I need to know a different way to say this. So I'm open to your suggestion, but I say the fish stinks from its head. And what does that mean? The fish stinks from its head. Yeah, I think it was Mark Twain that said that. And so it's like the senior leader, the very top is ultimately responsible. And if they're not, if they're not exuding and representing whatever it is that you want to change or that that you want to be um, your focus at the company, then it starts there. So the fish stings from its head. My, my, um, it just sounds so horrible, but it's true. Is this, so my approach is, and I did this decades ago when I first started my business, I, you know, I'd be going and I'd be consulting and coaching and then I'd say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. It's a, it's a waste of your time and nothing that I do or say and how I engage with your teams will stick unless we get this right at the top. And so I'm, I'm super passionate about that. I don't want to waste my time or anybody else's money if mm. that, if we can't get there. So that's, that's why you have a, have acknowledged it in that manner. And it requires if I may say so myself, certainly I'm not leading a company the size of Marriott, but it requires a level of vulnerability that I thought I was willing to bring forward because I'm like, you know, interested in spiritual things or whatever. I had (laughs) no idea what it would require for me to fix the culture within my own organization when I became CEO and even afterwards, because it required me to totally transform who I was if yes. I wanted, if I wanted to stay in the position, right? If the board, if the yep. investors weren't going to just kick me out to the curb, you know what I'm saying? Yep. And yep. so I went on this like incredibly challenging dark night of the soul, having to look at how my addiction to my emotions. I mean, I think people are so addicted. And then what was that causing? That was calling causing hella drama inside the company because I was right. addicted to feeling stuff, right? Even you know, I'd gone into a 12 step pre- recovery program for other things, but I was addicted to emotions. So when, when your leader is addicted to emotions, they're going to cause drama and it's going to be a blind spot that they can't possibly see. So now all of a sudden I need to look at my years of doing this, which predate this company that I'm now CEO of. So this is a, a, the fish thinks from the head. I actually think it's relevant. I just think it's a really scary proposition for clients. How do you get these presumably powerful people on your side and willing to go there with you? Yeah, one leader at a time. So I have a have I have the experience um, routinely that I'm I have drawn for whatever reason X leader from a company. And so we start doing our thing, you know, I'm coaching and such, and then they go, well, wait a minute, this is needed at this level and at this level. And so that's that's oftentimes how it how it works. Um, yeah, that's my preferred way for it to work. I'm not, um, I'm not Terry the marketer, and so I, I acknowledge that. And so I, I intend to do what I do well, one leader at a time, and then that um, transpires into other, other work, and me being on the big stage with lots of leaders and such. Right? Really cool. Really cool. What have other people uh, who have experienced? What have other people experienced who you've worked with? Um, you know, what, what have they experienced? What has been the transformation? Can you tell us stories about the transformations of people that you've worked with? Yeah, I can. And actually that leads to the retreats. So the transformation for an individual leader that I'm one-on-one coaching happens over time. And that can be six months, that can be a year, that can be a year and a half, whatever. It just depends. It depends on their readiness and it depends on the uh, amount of struggle they're experiencing. And so the transformation happens over time. The reason we started doing retreats was to make an immersive experience whereby that transformation could happen over, you know, three nights, five nights, you know, what have you. And that's that's actually why we're choosing to come to Imaloa and extend it to five nights, because they're even even more, even more can transpire over the course of five nights. So we did our first retreat. That's the feedback that we got. You know, I individuals are saying, you know, I've I've had coaching and I've and I've had workshops and I've had great um, speakers and such at our organization. But this, if it's all going to be about me, I need to step back. I need to retreat <laughs> into a safe space and really absorb all of this information at a different level. 
And so it happens faster. Hmm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. That's really beautiful. Yeah, I think I think if leaders are listening right now, have you ever really wanted to dive in deeper and be able to have this space to retreat? We just had a physician's retreat for some of the yeah. some of the best doctors and medical directors, and they've never given themselves the space to really retreat, Terry. Right. And I imagine what you're creating for a space is really meaningful to people who probably a break to them looks like going on vacation with their family or seeing their aging parents or whatever it might be. It's not perhaps investing in themselves. Uh, That's right. Yeah. I was just going to say, I love that you said investing in themselves because that's, that's what it's all about. Like, what are you prepared to invest in your own, not in just yourself right now, right here, right now, or the time of the retreat, but in yourself going forward. So think about me and the that time when the kids were seniors. And and if had I invested in myself before that, that would have taken me all the way through their high school years and college years and such. And instead, I waited for that epiphany, let's say, one could call it a break, <laughs> to, to cause that to happen because I didn't invest in myself. And so the investment is exactly that. It's It, it elongates the experience. And so that and that's important to me too, and to the rest of the team. <clears throat> I've stood on a stage before, Jake, in front of a thousand people, and I've left thinking, okay, a dozen people's lives have been transformed, and that's not enough, right? Just because they're very busy and they're not, not it's hard for them to be completely engaged, and they've been here before, and maybe some are hostages because they had to come, you know, that sort of thing. And I think, whoa, whoa, I don't want to do that anymore. When I'm speaking, I want to have full engagement, and I want there to be absolute key takeaways that change the people's lives. And that's how we feel about the retreat, too. We want it to be immersive to the point that the person goes back and lives their life differently. Beautiful. I just love this so much. Can you give me a sense of what the five days looks like? I know you're expanding it a bit for Imaloa and the experience Mm -hmm. that you're creating here. Give us a sense of like what people will gain, what they'll learn, what the experience Mm -hmm. will be like and and the daily flow. Like, can you talk, can you talk us through it a little bit? Yep. Yep. And that's how all three of us come in because I'm, I'm, super excited about the energy the three of us bring. And so you said earlier, so I, this is how we, another way that we look at it is that as, as, I, as I'm CEO and that is on the paper of the LLC has to be right. But I call myself really the chief experience officer. And that's what my E is. And then Lisa's chief spiritual officer and Deanna is more our chief creative officer. And so let's start with Deanna. So she's the one that holds space all day, every day in the five days. She does the um, starts with the yoga in the morning, and then she'll do some centering practices before breaks, after breaks to really help people stop and feel into what they just learned and and help to um, absorb it differently. And then she does the sound baths at night. Those are all optional. And then yoga again in the morning and then same thing, the centering practices. So that at the end, we call them pocket practices. They have these centering practices in their pocket ready at, to use at will when they're back in the workplace. So it's it's about the experience of it, but it's also about learning how to, to, to do this one thing. Let's say tapping, for example. That would be an example of something that she does. Anyway, so then Lisa and I are more doing more of the flow of the content. And I mentioned that, you know, with the neuroscience, I'm bringing to bear um, that the whole part about prioritizing well-being to promote productivity has to do with the neuroscience behind um, procrastination, the myth of multitasking, time suck tendencies, as I call them. And so how do we change that up? Like we, we're going to honor that this is what we're currently thinking in our current neural pathway, and we're going to build a different path. So that's the work around that. And then Lisa goes into the content, mostly Lisa, all of us, but mostly Lisa about refining spiritual intuitive intelligence. And we actually Again, practice. We teach how to uh, dive into one's intuitive intelligence, and then we provide examples and say, okay, you have this one issue. Let's solve for it from an intuitive intelligence standpoint. And we work through real challenges. This is so cool. You know, we've had like the United Nations and Beckley Foundation and all these corporate offsites. This is such a comprehensive five days for leadership. 
This is really yes. well done, Terry. I'm really excited for you guys. So are we. We are really excited. We just, you know, the first retreat that we did last year, and we have another one coming up in September, we learned that the combination of the three of us and, and the energy and the different uh, expertise that we bring is what the attendees uh, latch on to. And that's what their comments were. The testimonials were all about the experience that that was born out of the combination of our expertise. Yeah, it's like, you know, people talk about like head, heart, and body. Yeah. I don't know if people talk about that, but that's just what comes to mind. It's like, you, you're obviously very, you know, there's there's certain training that's going to happen and like deepening and it, there's an academic side, right. the head, the heart, and then actually getting into the somatics. This is great. This is great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so if you are listening and you think that this might be something that you want to look at for yourself, for your own company, um, uh, or just for your own personal development and you want to join Terry and Deanna and, oh my gosh, I've just lost Lisa. Her name. Lisa. Lisa. Sorry, uh -huh. Lisa. You can go to imaloainstitute.com slash Terry Short, T-E-R-R-E-S-H-O-R-T. Uh, Terry's retreat is happening April 23rd to 28th next year, 2024 at Imaloa. By the way, there's a huge incentive that Terry and her team have put forth for booking that you get a one-on-one -on -one session with each facilitator after the event, which is actually a great way for integrating what's been learned. So you get all of this stuff, perhaps it like turns you on to some new things, some new ideas within yourself, within your company. And then you get a one-on-one -on -one with each facilitator after the event. Um, to be able to integrate it. By the way, it's also a $700 value, y'all. So you can go to imaloainstitute.com slash Terry Short for more information. I can't wait to host you here next year, Terry. Thank you so much for taking time. Oh my gosh, Jake, it can't come soon enough. Okay. <laughs> I can't, sometimes I visualize myself in that environment because I've had the opportunity to be there. And that's what we want for people. We want them to go, okay, wait, I have a centering moment. I'm right there. And the toucan is in the tree. And I can feel it and it, and it fills me up. And now I'm going back to what I'm doing at work. And by the way, not, uh, not unrelated to what you just said, a lot of people, they realize that their transformational experience doesn't begin in your case, say April 23rd next year. It begins when they make the choice to come and buy the ticket. Yeah. It's That's like right. things That's start right. to become, they start to become more aware. So whether you're listening, maybe you haven't heard of Terry before, but you, you go and research her and you, and you love her work. You then start to attune yourself to a whole new way of being by right. putting that deposit down on the retreat or whatever it is. I mean, people got to do what they feel comfortable with doing, but I have heard many people who's like, I put the deposit down a year ago and my whole life started to change and now I'm here yeah. and I'm ready for this next chapter. So yeah, I'm glad yeah. that you're excited and hopefully people that are listening, if they're curious, they'll go to the site. And um, yeah, I think that's good. We'll see you next year, if not before. I'm super excited. And what you just explained to me is all about energy, right? So it's the energy, even the energy of the investment. It starts that that mo that momentum going. And I love that. It gives me chills to yeah. think about it. Well, yeah. I appreciate you sharing the stories that you shared as well. I think that that was really, you know, impactful. And for me, scheduling considering what well-being looks like as a priority rather than an afterthought after I've scheduled everything else. It's probably mm -hmm. the biggest, like it's subtle, but it's really profound because I'm not doing it enough. And I imagine many people listening also feel the same. So thanks for sharing that at the top. Absolutely. Yeah. We have lots of, lots of tools, um, lots of reframing, lots of um, key takeaways that will be very useful to the attendees. All right. Thanks, yeah. Terry. Thank you, Jake. We'll Appreciate you it. See you soon. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>